thin in the game. Let's see. All right. Let's make sure we are in. This part is always the fun part of the day to make sure that the live is working and we are on. Um, I wanna thank you all for joining us again. Another great Money Monday. Um, as we've talked over the last few weeks and so forth, this issue is an issue that I think a lot of our business owners are gonna run into. Um, but more so recently, one of our past speakers, um, the owner of Ivy's Tea, was having an issue of someone coming in and kind of stealing her brand and really kind of doing, probably speeding up the process and some of her vision and so forth. And she was in a great situation because she had done the work, she had done the prep, so she could defend her intellectual property. And so um, as I was kind of seeing this run through and play through for her, I was like, oh my gosh, like <laughs> we need to talk about this um, because it is of so much value for us to understand the what ifs and what could potentially happen um, and to be prepared for that as well. So we understand a little bit in terms of what could potentially happen if you're not doing what you need to do and so forth. So we have a phenomenal speaker with us, Nicole Gaither. Um, she's a partner with Polator Law Group and practice in, in the field of copyright and trademark prosecution in addition to tax laws. She's demonstrated um, experience in prosecuting domestic trademark copyright applications, providing brand protection through trademark monitoring, reviews, refusals, responses to refusals, which I'm sure a lot of people are going to see, and assessing potential marks for use and availability. And so it's really great for us to have her join us here today. And it's key for us to make sure that we have a good understanding of what we're creating and make sure that we're able to truly profit off of it and pass it down for generations to come. So thank you so much, Nicole, for joining us. Um, and so I'll let you kind of jump right into our presentation. I know a few ladies have already said, hey, make sure you ask a lot of questions or they've said, hey, I can't wait for this one tonight. And so we'll have, it's going live in our group as well. So we'll kind of bump in. And if you have questions, ladies, just let us know and we'll make sure that we're able to go through them. Yeah, definitely. Thank you, Rosalyn. Uh, as Rosalyn said, I'm Nicole Gaither. I'm a partner with the Polytory Law Group. Uh, it's a virtual law firm. We're based out of New York, but I'm actually a Louisiana admitted attorney, but I live in Maryland. So that is the benefit of working for a virtual law firm that I can work from anywhere in the world for this law firm and still be able to do the work that I enjoy. So I focus my practice mainly on copyright and trademark law, um, of course, doing prosecution stuff like registrations, also enforcement. So, you know, making sure that my clients can protect their rights that they have in their intellectual property and monitoring. So we also look to see if there are any uses that we need to be aware of and a couple other things beyond that. So we also are focusing on licensing opportunities, franchising, collaborations, those types of things. Um, so I am a part of the business law section. So I do also try to make sure I get an understanding of my client's business because the intellectual property part is a piece of it. Um, but ultimately, I also need to have an understanding of like what you're, you're doing now, what your goals are, because if you don't have a good business structure or foundation to work from, then me going forward with this intellectual property protection is going to be useless if we don't have something that's going to be using this, <laughs> these assets that we're working so hard to protect. So I was going to go over this presentation, which I'm hoping is not too long. I just wanted to kind of hit on some high points. So of course, I'm probably going to skip through some of the, the, the slides that I made. But you know, I just kind of want to get everybody to understand how important legal protections are in your business. And they kind of start from the front end um, of just making sure that you have certain things in place for your business to be successful. So let me make sure I can share my screen. All right, so I hope everybody. All right, can everybody see the slides there? Yep. All right, so yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I'm focusing on how legal can protect your business and help make you more money. So again, like I mentioned, we're probably not gonna go through all these things. And if you do have questions about them, I can answer them um, on the back end. 
or, you know, whatever's easier. Um, I tend to also talk fast, so I will probably race through the things that I'm like, yeah, that's important, but let's get to this part that I know everybody's focused on, which is my favorite, the intellectual property piece, and of course, the copyright and trademark section. So, all right. And like I mentioned, the legal system applies to your business, even if you don't know it. So like there are certain things that you probably need to make sure that you're doing them right from the beginning, or else you might end up having to pay a lot more in the end for having to fix them. And like I mentioned today, like I want to talk about business entities very briefly, you know, certain contracts that you probably should have in your business very briefly. And again, our main focus is going to be on intellectual property. And of course, I always have to give a disclaimer as to what we're talking about, because I am a lawyer. However, I am not your lawyer. So that means that I cannot answer your specific question until you have engaged me as your attorney. Um, and the things that I'm giving in this presentation are basically to provide information. They're not legal advice. And if you have a legal question, you should retain a lawyer familiar with that area of law that you know you need help with. Um, but I, you know, if you do want to have ask questions and if you want to engage me, then my information is right here. It's Nicole.Gaither at proletorylawgroup.com. I always do that. I move myself and then I can't do the slideshow again. <laughs> so I need to to this. Yes, that helps. All right. So as I mentioned, some of the basics when you're dealing with a business, you know, depending on when you're just getting started or you're kind of, you started selling, but you haven't gone through all the formalities. Um, one of the things that you probably should consider, and this is to help protect you, is to, you know, form your business, either registering it as a limited liability company within your, your state or as a corporation. And it really depends on what you're you're looking to do and what you're trying to achieve and what you're, you know, your what services or goods that you're selling. So that's something you should probably talk to your tax accountant about because it's also going to affect your tax situation. And then also an attorney to make sure that you're forming the right business structure. So forming a business structure helps protect your personal assets in case you are sued. So this would protect like your house, your bank account, your 401k, anything that possibly could, you know, someone could come after if they end up suing you either you know, maybe there's a contract that went wrong or someone was in your store and they were injured, anything like that. So it's definitely a good idea to have a business entity formed so that you can protect your personal assets. So that again, if anything like that should happen, the only thing that someone would be able to take would be from your business assets. Also contracts are definitely a good thing to have in your business, um, of course. And I'd actually even say, that's probably the first place you should start. Even if you haven't yet formed a business entity, you should actually have contracts in place in your business, um, such as like client agreements so that everyone knows and they're on the same page regarding like what the terms of the agreement are, who's giving what, who's paying what, when you're getting paid, how you need to terminate the agreement if someone doesn't follow what they're supposed to be doing, what happens if there is a breach of the agreement, all these things. So you know, definitely having a client agreement in place is a good idea. Also looking at some other, and we're gonna kind of go through it. So like, I'm gonna skip through. Yeah, so like I kind of looked at some of the contracts that you might need for your small business, especially also if you're working only on online business. So some of the high points, like I mentioned the client customer agreement. Um, if you're doing like a partnership or collaboration with another business, you definitely wanna have something in place so that everybody knows what they're supposed to be bringing to the table and what they're leaving with and how you're splitting those um, profits, like what you're going to do with this thing that you're creating, if that's what you're doing. Um, also having employment agreements in place with the employees that you have on staff, um, non-disclosure agreements with any, you know, to protect anything that you have that is, you know, needs to be kept secret or kept confidential in your business. You want to make sure that if you're dealing with independent contractors or even employees or vendors who might need to be, you know, in the know of like some of the things that you do in your business, then you want to have non-disclosure agreements in place so that you can put some protections in place in case, you know, someone does violate one of those and so that you have recourse to, um, to protect you. Um, Non-competes, also liability waivers, like let's say you might be having an event somewhere, you want to make sure that you're, well, I know it's, it's COVID, but in case we actually are able to do things in person ever again, you might want to make sure that you actually have liability waivers in place to protect you in case you're having an event, somebody gets hurt, someone falls, or anything like that. Also, if you're running an online business, website agreements are extremely important to have to protect you. You want to have things like terms of use so that people who are going to your website understand exactly 
how they're supposed to act when they're there. Um, also having any kind of uh, pol privacy policy if you're collecting information from people who are visiting your websites and some states require that you actually have privacy policies and that you have them spelled, you know, certain things spelled out in them. Like California is one of these states where they're very specific about their privacy policy uh, regulations. So just a few things that you all, you know, probably should be aware of, make sure that you have um, in place. And of course, like I said, I was gonna race through some of that things because I wanted to focus on the bread and butter of the part that I actually love and kind of nerd out on your intellectual property. And like, if you do have questions about contracts or business formations, definitely, um, you know, put them in the chat or however you all are doing it. And we can talk about it toward the end. So just keep them in mind, you know, write them down, put them in there and we'll discuss them. All right, so intellectual property for your business. And there are four main types of intellectual property, and this is focused on the United States. Um, other countries have their own versions. Pr primarily, they're the same as like in all countries, but some of them are called different things, and then some have different types of protection. So in the United States, we focus on these four types, patents, trade secrets, trademarks, and copyrights. Um, so I'm gonna go through each one individually so you can kind of make sure that you know the basics and the difference between each one of them. Cause I know a lot of people get confused and they think like, oh, I need to patent my business name. And it's like, no, that's really trademark law. And then, you know, I need to copyright this. And that might actually also fall under trademark. It might even be a patent. So I feel like it's very important that we all kind of understand what the different types of intellectual property are so that we know where we are when we're talking about them individually. So as I mentioned, patents, they use protect inventions. So like this is like the light bulb or MP3 player. You know, these are things that, you know, are usually think of mechanical things like your iPhone, your laptop, probably at some point had a patent on it. And sometimes they still have a patent on it. There's some, that, something that's been improved on it so they might have a patent. So, you know, patents actually must be useful. They have to, you know, solve a problem that's in the, you know, the marketplace or in the world. Um, they must be novel or new and also non-obvious. So like if you decide, well, I like my MacBook, but I wish it came in pink and I want a patent on a pink MacBook, that's a little too obvious. And besides, there's probably, I think there's already a pink MacBook Air. So yeah, it's not gonna be anything like changing a color or a shape. It's gonna be something that's gonna add something that no one else really thought of and to not think that was too obvious. Like this, you know, should be something that needs to be added to this invention to make it better. I am not a patent attorney. Um, patent attorneys have to take a separate bar exam to in order to prosecute and file patent applications. And generally those applications read like, um, yeah, they, they're pretty complex. And most patent attorneys do have a science background. So it's almost required for that. And for you to take the patent bar, you have to have that science background as well. So I do not have a science background. I have an accounting background. I'm not going back to school to take that exam. Um, I think about it and then I'm like, yeah, no, I'm good. Mm -hmm. So if you're dealing with something that might possibly be protected by a patent, definitely, you know, look on. So on the USPTO website, there are actually a list of registered patent attorneys that are available. So I would highly, you know, you know, I would recommend that you consult with that list because, you know, you might want to, you see these commercials for like, uh, is it an event? tech or whoever it is, it's like a little invention place and they'll file a patent application for you. They're probably not filing like the patent application you might need where it's gonna get you that full level of protection. They're probably filing what's called a provisional, which is just kind of the starting point. So I would definitely, if you feel like you have something that's gonna be protected by a patent, find a patent attorney. And if you need you know, some recommendations, suggestions, I have a list of them because I do have to refer some of my clients to them because like I said, I do not do patents. And I sometimes don't even know what might not be, you know, what might be protected by patents. So I don't want to take the risk of telling somebody that it's not. I'd rather they talk to a professional about it. Trade secrets. These are things that, you know, are kept, you know, these are the confidential things in your business. So these are things that if they were to get out that they would, you know, reduce your competitive edge. So these are things that you want to keep secret. They should be on a need to know basis. These are things like recipes or like I mentioned here, like secret formulas for making beverages. Um, they can be like your client list, vendor list. 
anything that if, you know, someone else got their hands on it, then it would affect your business greatly. And, you know, there it's pretty valuable to you. So these are not registered with any type of entity because of course, if they were registered, they would no longer be secret. So these are generally protected by making sure that you mark them confidential, you keep them in a safe place that no one else had, you know, that only limited people have access to. And then also if someone is going to have access to these items, then you want to make sure that you put in place like non-disclosure agreements or confidentiality agreements so that you are protected in case they are, you know, these things get out so that you have some recourse again, like as I mentioned earlier, that you're protected. All right, now we're getting closer to my favorite areas, copyrights. And this is kind of the things where we just want to make sure we understand the difference. So I try to make it easy to explain what a copyright is versus a trademark or patent. Um, copyrights protect like original artistic and literary work. So like think creative things, like creative content. So like plays, books, music, artwork, even like your website can be protected by copyright photographs, videos, if you have like a, a digital product or e-course that you're offering, that could be protected by copyright. So those are, you know, just keep these things in mind. So this is things that, that have content. So like creative things, artistic, have literary content, all those things are generally protected by copyrights. So they have to have just, it doesn't even have to be like unique. It just has to have some minimal level of creativity for it to be protected and also be put in a form where it's tangible and other people can see it. So I kind of give the example of like, you know, if you write a poem on a napkin, then it's protected by copyright and copyright protection is automatic. Once you have that creative um, piece or spark that you have and you write it down, then it's protected. And here are some examples of things that can are protected by copyright. So like I mentioned, literary works, music, like songs, like the lyrics, even like the recording of the song, dramatic works with like plays, uh, choreographic works, certain dances can be protected. They have to be kind of like, it can't just be like that dance, like, you know, oh God, what I wanna call it, the soldier boy or something like that. It has to be like an actual dance movement, like a whole, like think of like a whole ballet act. That would be probably more, you know, likely to be protected by copyright versus like uh, one little step in a dance. So choreographic works are kind of hard to, to deal with the copyright and there are actually some professionals who focus mainly on that area, which is kind of crazy, but it happens. Um, you know, pictures, like I mentioned, movies um, and architectural works can even be protected by copyright. Copyright does not protect facts or ideas. So if you notice, I do not have anything about facts or ideas here on this example because you know the way it's the way that you express those facts of ideas so we are probably not going to be able to like the example i like to give is like the phone book the phone book is pretty much full with facts but if i were to take the phone book and decide i was going to make my own version of it and put it in order of people who have blue houses then amazingly enough that probably could be protected by copyright because it was my expression of those facts now how useful is that going to be for most people Probably not because I mean, how many of us know who lives in a blue house? I'm not sure, but that's just kind of give you an example of like why, you know, ideas and facts are not protected, but it's your expression of those ideas and facts that can be protected. So like a recipe cannot, you know, it's generally not protected by copyright because it's just a list of ingredients and it gives a description. Um, but, you know, keeping in mind separate from like a trade secret, it's like if you had, you know, like I mentioned, like a recipe or a, you know, beverage or something in your business that was like the main bread and butter for you and you didn't want anybody to get it, you know, have it out there, then that would be protected by trade secret. But like a listing of a recipe where you list the different ingredients and the instructions, that's not protected by copyright. Now, if I were to put a whole group of recipes in a cookbook and included like some pictures and some like stories about it, that can be protected by copyright. And now, like I mentioned, there's no, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. A number or a logo, be, um, can you copyright a number or a logo? I'm guessing maybe her business name might be, I don't know, 245 or something like that. Could that be something that she could copyright? So the number probably would not be protected by copyright unless it was in some kind of, so like if it was like some kind of graphic, just, you know, design or like some unique way or creative way that it would define. So, 
some logos can be protected by copyright along with trademark law. So logos generally fall under trademark law, but if they have some kind of artistic or graphic element to them, they can be protected by copyright. Oh, I got um, it. Right. Again, hashtag. <laughs> oh, oh, hashtag. Oh my gosh. So we're going to talk about hashtags tonight. Too, you know? <laughs> hashtags are a little tricky animal. They can be protected by trademark law. Um, if you are using them in such a way that they're identifying a source of your goods and services. So they can't really be used as like a hashtag that you're putting like at the bottom of your social media posts. They have to actually be used as like hashtag brand of this. So hashtags can be protected by trademarks, but they have to be done in a certain way. So it can't be like, because hashtags are technically metadata. So keep that in mind. So if you're using it as like a hashtag on your Instagram post, then it's probably not going to be, you know, protected by trademark law. And it's definitely not protected by copyright. So that's the other thing. Copyright does not protect like book titles or song titles or like even like short quotes. So that's another thing that people need to be aware of because people are like, oh, well, my song title needs to be protected by copyright. No, but it might be if you do it right, you could protect it via trademark, but you actually have to, you know, use it in connection with a certain sale of goods and services. So a hashtag if it's done right, could possibly be protected by trademark, but not by copyright. Answer the question? Yep, I think that's good. Cool. All right. Now, if you find that someone is using your content without your permission, then it's more than likely infringement. Um, so, you know, keep that in mind when you're using other people's content and when somebody's using your content. If they didn't have the right to use it, then it's probably they're infringing. And we're going to go into that a little bit later through the presentation. Um, but if you are the owner of a work that, you know, is protected by copyright, that gives you the exclusive rights, which, you know, prevents other people from doing this unless they have permission. So they cannot copy, like you get to, the right to copy it. You get the right to use your work. You get the right to distribute your work. You can perform it if it's like something like a, you know, a play. Um, you can also, you know, display it if it's like an artwork, like a photograph. And then also like if you can also, well, this kind of, it's called a derivative work. So let's say that you have a podcast that you've done and then you want to actually transcribe that podcast and post it as a blog post. That's pretty much making a derivative work of your podcast. So you have that right to do it. And unless somebody has permission to do it from you, they don't have the right to do that. So nobody can go and take your podcast and then set up their own blog post with it. So that's an infringement of your copyright. So keep that in mind. So be on the lookout for those kinds of things. And the biggest thing is with copyright, registration is not required for you to get automatic protection. However, there are additional benefits that come from registration of your copyright. And it's, the, it's pretty cheap and it's not a very complex application process. The application is available electronically on the copyright.gov website. Um, they give you pretty much the instructions if you have the time and a couple of hours to actually go through them. But there are individual applications for the different types of um, copyright that, you know, the content. So like there's a separate application for music works. There's a separate one for like artwork. There's a separate one for like literary works. So if you know exactly what you're going to be filing and they also give examples of like what, you know, qualifies under each application. So you just fill out the application. You make sure that you know who the owner is, when the work was created. Um, you have to pay the fee. There are a couple of things, of course, as a part of the application, but I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, the fee is either $45 or $65, depending on what you're filing, um, what you're trying to apply for. And then you also just have to send in a copy, you see electronically, of what you're trying to protect. So like, and that goes to the Library of Congress because there's just, you know, as a part of the law, they keep a copy of what you're trying to protect as a copyright. It's a very long drawn out thing about why they do that, but pretty much that is a part of the process of the application for a copyright registration. And so, as I mentioned, copyright protection is automatic, which means that as soon as you put something creative with an ounce of creativity to a, you know, fixed format, like as, you know, some people say is put you put pen to paper, you have something that's protected by copyright. Registration allows you to you know, prove that you own that, that copyright. Um, you also get the benefit of being able to sue someone if you actually, if someone infringes on your copyright. So with, with that comes like additional benefits of being able to get 
damages that you don't have to like, you know, find out, well, how much did this person make from it? How much did I lose? You can get statutory damages that are set by the law. And you also might possibly get your attorney's fees paid for. So there's some, you know, there are additional benefits also, like let's say you are selling a good um, that is protected by copyright. Like let's say you have like t-shirts that have like artwork on it or anything like jewelry. And if you register your copyright registration with the U.S. Custom and Border Patrol or Border Protection now, they will actually be on the lookout for any infringing works that might, you know, accomplish your copyright. Um, so that's also some a benefit as well as having copyright registration. So, um, and we can talk more about that later if you all have questions. But I kind of wanted to hit on that point because I mean, registration again not required. Yeah, Kim sorry. Kimberly asks, when you publish a book, is it automatically copyrighted? When you publish a book, as long as it's like in a format that someone else can see, it is automatically protected by copyright. Now, again, registration is different. So your publication of that book does not mean it's registered. That is only done through filing an application through the US Copyright Office and on their website. Good stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, any questions about registration? Because I don't want to, I could bore y'all with all the fun details of it, but it's a pretty straightforward process. It's probably one of the easiest things that you could do on your own. Um, you know, I'm one of the people who is just like, I could do it for you, but you could do it yourself because it's pretty straightforward. But there are some nuances if you don't do it right. But you know, if you don't do it right, you get another stab at it. So like you can file another application, but it's just, you know, you might be out that $45 or $65. And I also want to mention like if you're if someone is infringing on your work, like let's say someone actually, you know, you know somebody has been like reposting your social media posts. If you have registered those images, like if you start to notice that someone is infringing and they can, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, then I would suggest if you, you know, know that that's going on and those are things that they're valuable to you and they're your business, then if something is valuable to your business, then I would consider like registering it so that you have that right because a cease and desist letter stands a lot harder and, you know, means a lot more when you have a registration to back it up. So, you know, these are things just to keep in mind as well. And we kind of talked about this, but like, yeah, you cannot copyright a name. Generally, if you have like a business name um, or, you know, name that you're using in connection with a product or a service, it's generally protected by trademark law. And I hear this a lot where people are like, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't use whatever it is to make money from it. I just posted it. You still can be violating and infringing on somebody's rights, even if you don't make money. And just by giving credit, like saying like, oh, this is so-and-so's photo, that does not mean that you are in the clear. That's still infringement. You have to ask for permission. However, there is a carve out of the copyright law where there are certain things that are not considered infringement um, if you're using them for certain things. Like, you know, if you're telling news stories or like it's a parody or criticism, these might fall under what's called fair use. Um, so that's actually, the problem with fair use is it's not necessarily like a you know a set determined thing like oh yeah that's fair use no you know it's not infringement the fact is fair use is decided generally by a court by a judge or a jury so you might still get sued for infringement and a court might be the thing that decides if it's fair use um if you all heard about uh Nicki minaj and tracy chapman case so they're Nick, you know Nicki minaj had the song that was featuring a sample of a tracy chapman song and she reached out to Tracy Chapman. Tracy, you know, denied her the right to use the song, pretty much just kept saying like, no, I don't want you to use it, but the song was already made with the sample in it. So apparently some kind of way, and this is, this is where the facts are in dispute, Funkmaster Flex got hold of the song and played it, even though the song is not featured on Nikki's album, but Funkmaster Flex played it. And of course people probably recorded it from the radio or however they did it. And so Tracy Chapman did sue Nicki Minaj over the use of the song and the fact that the song was released in some format. And the court, uh, I think it was last week, just came down to say that the use of that sample 
um, where Nikki used the sample and it wasn't meant to be distributed and she didn't put it on her album, even though Funkmaster Flex got it, that was considered fair use because you cannot limit, you know, like if someone's being creative and they're using a sample of a song, you can't consider that to be infringement. It, it's a kind of complex, but like pretty much the court determined that it was fair use. And so, sorry, I have somebody calling me right now. <laughs> Um, the court determined that it was fair use because it was, you know, so it's still, it wasn't determined to be infringement. Sorry, I apologize. <laughs> this person is trying to reach me, but they've called me multiple times already. So as I was trying to say before, I was so interrupted. These things happen, I guess. Um, it's con it was considered fair use. So it was not considered infringement because she had the right to use it to see if it was something that she was going to release in her album. So that's kind of an example of where fair use is. And it's usually like determined if it's related to certain areas of you know, use. So again, a court has to be the thing that decides whether or not it's fair use. And this is the thing that trips a lot of people up. Just because it's online, it does not mean it's in a public domain. I've heard this from people who are like, well, I found it online. I found it on Google. So that's public domain. That is not a public domain. The public domain is actually an area where if, um, so like these are things that are no longer protected by copyright law. So like either the copyright has expired, so like they no longer are protected under the law of copyright, or they were explicitly placed in the public domain where somebody was like, I created this, uh, but I am relinquishing my copyright protection rights. So it's free for anyone to use. Those are things that are in the public domain. And you can actually do a search to see where things are in the public domain. So the rule of thumb is that if anything was created like before 1924, it's probably no longer protected by copyright. So it's free to use with some, you know, you probably wanna make sure and check that it is free to use, but that's what the public domain is. And I also wanted to give an example of like what a proper copyright notice was. It is, and like, you again, you don't even need to have registration in order to give a notice of copyright because again, copyright protection is automatic. So this is using that circle C the year that you published it or put it out, and then listing either you and your individual right or your company as the owner of the copyright. And you can also add in like all rights reserved, or I mean, the all rights reserved is not even necessary, but you know, it usually helps because that again is reserving all those rights that come with the copyright. So that's your right to copy, your right to display, to perform, all those rights that you get with copyright. Now I wanna make sure like, I'm going through my notes to make sure I have not forgotten anything. But the main thing is with copyright is if you see someone else's work and you want to use it, ask for permission before you try to use it. Um, you know, because if you don't have permission, it's pretty much an infringing use, which means you could possibly be sued and pay damages for using something without someone's permission. Um, if you're like on social media and you see like someone has posted something on Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or Pinterest or TikTok, you know, without permission, it is actually infringement for you to repost someone else's work. So even though you have that option, like within the, the platform to repost, you still should contact that person and ask them permission to be able to repost. And they, you know, if you can probably send them a direct message or whatever, or like even in the comment, like, hey, do you mind if I share this? And most people are like, they like the exposure. So they usually grant you the permission. I, I mean, I've, I always, when I want to reshare or repost from somebody, I always contact them and wait for them to give me permission to repost it. So just keep, you know, those are things just to keep in mind, because again, you could be sued. And we're seeing that, you know, unfortunately the law has not caught up to the modern day. So like, we're still trying to get a copyright law into the 21st century. And unfortunately, a lot of celebrities are seeing this and they're getting sued by, you know, like they might have a photo, like some, you know, paparazzi or photographer took a photo of them and posted on their Instagram. The celebrity sees it and reposts it and they're getting sued by the photographer, which is crazy because it's literally the photo they're in, but that doesn't give you the right to, to repost it because you don't own the copyright in it. The person who took that photo owns the copyright in that photo. You still have to ask permission to repost it even though you are in the photo. And trademarks. So does anybody have any questions about copyright before we kind of move into a new area? 
I just want to make sure. A lot of people were shocked about that, about the picture of themselves um, and being sued about that. We got a couple of wows from that. I mean, that's definitely something unexpected that I'm sure most of us just didn't know. Oh, yeah. Like, I can, let's see, Gigi Haddad has been sued a couple of times. Um, I want to say maybe Taylor Swift. J-Lo was recently sued, like last year, I think. LeBron James was sued earlier this year. And I'm going to get his name wrong. He plays for the Houston Texans. Deshaun Watson, I think. He's a football player. He just got sued by some photographer reposting like three of his own photos. So yeah, again, if you even if you're in the photo, that does not mean you own it. <laughs> like, you have to ask permission. So the person who owns that photo, who owns the copyright, is more than likely, you know, the author. And sometimes they'll grant you permission. Sometimes they, they won't. Like, I would think in that case, if it's a celebrity and the celebrity is like, hey, you mind if I repost the photo, then that would be a great compliment. But in this case, yeah, I guess not. So they're getting sued. And I think some people use it as a way to make money because they know that, you know, eventually the law is not, you know, on the side of the person who's in the photo. It's on the side of the person who owns the photo right now. But maybe one of these cases will actually, you know, help bring the law to the modern day. And maybe it will change and where like if you are in a photo, you have that right to repost it because you're featured in it, but that's not the way the law is written right now. All right, trademarks. Trademarks are like brand names. So think of the name of like, I put in here your favorite cereal or your shoes. Trademarks identify the source um, of a product or service. So this is how you can identify that you are buying Nike shoes and not Adidas shoes because there's a trademark on them. So like you see, you probably see it's, I, I kind of dimmed it, but this is, I am in 95 Nike Air Max fan. I don't want to tell you how many of them I have and I will buy a new pair whenever I want a new pair because it's like, oh, I need a new color. So I'm going to get a new color. So um, I, you know, go to the Nike website, but this is a 95 Air Max and you can see the swoosh. So like, if you see that, that swoosh, you know that's Nike. Like you don't even have to see the words. You see that swoosh, you know that that is Nike. So that is their logo, that swoosh. So trademarks are usually, like I mentioned, words, designs, or a combination of words and designs. Um, and there are other types of trademarks that, you know, some things, these are things that, you know, you can identify who, is the source of the goods and services. So colors can be protected by trademark, sounds, scents, and even the way a product looks can be protected by a trademark. And wait, hold on, I'm gonna go back because there's something I did wanna say about this. So like I mentioned, trademarks are ways that we identify a product or service. So think of them as marks of trade. So trade being like, you know, related to sales, marketing, so trademarks are marks of trade. So they are things that are, you know, con connected with things that are being sold, like goods and services. So that's probably the easiest way to, to tell the difference between like what a trademark is, a copyright or a patent. Like, um, trying to think of some other things to kind of give you all an example before I go into all the deep dive stuff. I think that's probably it on that. I just want to make sure I mention that. So like we can kind of tell the difference between what a trademark, copyright, patents, and trade secrets are. And these are examples of traditional trademarks. So like you usually will see like words. So like KFC has a registered trademark for the KFC. So like that's the name of their business now is KFC. They used to be Kentucky Fried Chicken, but apparently now they're KFC. Um, and I think from what I understand, they had to change to KFC because the state of Kentucky actually filed a trademark for Kentucky. Um, and I'm probably going to get that story a little wrong, but unfortunately, because the state of Kentucky filed for trademark for Kentucky, they wanted to get a licensing fee from Kentucky Fried Chicken, and Kentucky Fried Chicken was like, yeah, we're good on that. We're just going to be KFC from now on. So that is why they are now KFC. Um, I'm sure some of you all might be familiar with the Starbucks logo, um, but here it is, like one of the probably more familiar things that we see from the cups. And then also the Apple slogan, think different. So you know, words can be protected, logos can be protected, slogans, taglines, any way for your customers to be able to identify you from other people in the marketplace. And some examples of non-traditional trademarks, as I mentioned, colors can be protected by trademarks. So like Tiffany blue is protected by a trademark. So like that's a Robin egg blue. Um, scents like Play-Doh 
And I was trying to get some other colors. Like the, the red soles of Louboutin shoes are protected by trademark. So that's why you don't see any other shoes, like high heel shoes with red soles, because that is a Louis, Christian Louboutin registered trademark. And they will come after anyone who tries to get a red sole shoe. Uh, the brown that UPS uses for their trucks. So that's also protected by a registered trademark. Um, the smell of Play-Doh is protected by a registered trademark. It's like a cherry vanilla scent, which is crazy. Um, so also, I did not know this and I had to ask somebody, but I guess maybe I have never been in a Verizon store, but the musk scent that is in a Verizon store is protected by a trademark, which is wild to me because I'm like, I don't even associate that, but it is protected. Now you and, guys want to go to Verizon just to like. <laughs> all right. It's like, I want to walk into a Verizon store. Like I got one around the corner. So I might go in there just be like, so I can smell this, <laughs> this musk, musk smell, <laughs> but I'm sure it might not be musky. <laughs> it might be musty. <laughs> Um, bounce can be protected by trademarks, like the MGM lion roar that you hear, you know, in movies, that's protected by a trademark, a registered trademark. Pitbull has actually gotten a registered trademark for that. Uh, oh God, I'm gonna get it wrong. It's like that, hey, yo, whatever, but I'm not using it in connection with a good service. So I can say it, but yeah, so that's protected by a registered trademark. The NBC chimes, the Netflix, the dumb is protected. And then also, I uh, know some of y'all might remember AOL, so you've got mail, that sound is protected by a registered trademark. Trade dress can protect things like how they appear. So it can protect packaging. Um, it can protect like, like, an example is like a store, like how a store or a restaurant or a location looks. So like the colors that are used, the, you know, the different form, like the, I guess, you know, how it's laid out is, you know, can be protected by a trademark under trade dress. So the shape of a Coca-Cola bottle, like how it has like those ridges and like that little almost hourglass shape is protected by a registered trademark. Um, the red seal on the, you know, the red seal wax on the Maker's Mark bottle is protected by a registered trademark. Shapes and colors of IHOP restaurants, which I did not know this, they're protected by a registered trademark. The shape of goldfish crackers and the shape of Hershey Kisses are protected by registered trademarks. And one of the things that is important, like if you're just starting out and you come up with a name or a logo or a slogan, like generally I tell people, if you're gonna be you know, starting a business, the first thing that you wanna do is to protect is the name of your business or whatever you're using to sell your goods and services. So. You know, if you are using your business name or maybe you're using like a doing business as, but this is like the way that people are identifying you. So like if they go on social media or they do a search on Google and they, you know, search for a name and they're able to find your business. And that's probably how you want to be identified. So that would be considered your trademark and trademark rights come from you. So once you start selling goods and services, you have a trademark. Now you have limited rights in that trademark because you don't, you're limited you know, unfortunately the law is, you're, if you don't have it registered, you don't have exclusivity. So like if you are, you know, using a trademark and you live in Maryland and you're selling goods and services, even if you're selling them online, you can't stop somebody, like let's say you sell candles in Maryland. You can't sell somebody in California who is selling candles and they're using the same name because you don't have a right to stop them because you don't have exclusivity over that name until you have actually filed and gotten a registration from the US Patent and Trademark Office. So those are things that you know you need to keep in mind because some people are like, oh, well, I don't need to register my trademark. I've been using it. Nobody else is using it, whatever. Well, if somebody in another state comes up with a name and they start using it, then, then what? because then the question is going to be like, who started using it first? And, you know, do you need to rush to go register? And the registration process is not exactly a short process. It can take up to a year or more to get a registration. So again, things to keep in mind. But I tell people is, if you're going to be starting out and if you're kind of on a budget, the first thing you definitely want to look at protecting is your name, unless there's some reason why your name probably might not be protected, like one being that somebody else has something like it or similar in your industry or if it's considered descriptive. So like these would be if you are calling it like the best, uh, I'm not gonna say cupcake because that's just basically generic. So like generic words are not protected. So like if I'm selling 
laptops and I'm calling them laptop. I can't get a, you know, I can't get a trademark for that. Like, because that's pretty much telling me, telling everybody what I'm selling. So that's not giving the source of what I sell. That's just telling people what I sell. Descriptive would be like, if I called them like best, uh, Oh gosh, I'm I'm drawing a blank. Like I'm trying to think of like something that would be considered descriptive um, that has least been, you know, like sometimes using like surnames is considered descriptive. Using locations like for New Orleans, everybody started going through this whole thing where everybody was calling everything Nola, and it was like Nola this, Nola that. Well, the trademark office caught on to that. Like they're not the the dumbest cookies in the bunch. Like they will catch on to stuff. So like they started seeing a bunch of Nola stuff, and it was coming from New Orleans. They were like, Oh, that's New Orleans, Louisiana. Yeah, that's considered descriptive. You're giving me the location. There's nothing special about this. So there, you know, that's that's one thing. So if it gives kind of like a characteristic or a function or describes something about it, um, then it's it's probably going to be considered descriptive and it might be rejected. Uh, like an example of this is Best Buy. So like we all know about Best Buy, but Best Buy is actually considered descriptive because it's pretty much you know where you go get the Best Buy for electronics. Best Buy is a registered trademark, though, and the reason how you know how it got there is because it had to basically acquire distinctiveness. Like they had to prove that people were familiar with the fact that that place, you know, that, that Best Buy is a source of these electronics, so that people know about it. So it took some time for them to actually get to that point where they could get a registered trademark and get that level of protection. So that's the issue with descriptive trademarks. Like I know people are like, well, I want people to know exactly what I'm selling. Yeah, that's great, but if you know it's Ray's Pizza Shop that's telling me exactly what you're selling. That does not tell me it's any different from Roy's pizza shop. So just things to keep in mind. So like, there's some trademarks that are a lot stronger um, to use versus like ones that are weaker. So like, as I mentioned, generic trademarks do not get protection. So like, these are like telling me exactly what you're selling. Descriptive, very limited protection if protected at all. Um, it, like moving through the spectrum, things that are considered like suggestive. So they kind of, I have to use my imagination to determine what it is. Like examples of this are like Greyhound bus ways, um, Jaguar for cars, because it's like, oh, it's fast, like a Jaguar. Um, snuggle for fabric softener. Like I'm supposed to, you know, kind of imagine like snuggling being, you know, soft and oh, okay, it's fabric softener. Uh, another examples, like the, as you move through, and I'm, I'm sorry, I should have put an example here of like a, a spectrum, but I kind of didn't want to go into all the deep dive of that. But uh, like arbitrary, like made up words are the strongest level. So like this is like your Kodak, your Exxon, things that are made up words. Um, and then arbitrary would be like words that are actually in the English language, but have been applied to things that don't match. So this is like apple for computers. Like it's not really apple the fruit, it's apple for computers. Shell for oil or marathon for oil, Nike for shoes. Um, so things that are actually words but are applied to different um, goods and services. So those are considered very strong trademarks. And what I was trying to say was, of course, like focusing on when you're first starting out, you know, the main thing I tell people to focus on is, you know, protecting your business name. You know, that's probably the first place to, to, just, to start because that's the strongest level of protection that you could possibly get is being able to use your name because you can also use it in different, um, I'm not gonna say formats, but like you can use it in different colors and fonts and maybe even as a part of your logo. So that gives you a strong level of protection and stops other people from being able to use it. But when you are first starting out and you're trying to figure out a name, you should definitely do a search. And that's to make sure that no one else is using that name or something similar to it, because it's also that's you know trademark law is looking at things that might confuse customers. So you're looking at, it might not be exact, but if it's something that's similar and if a customer is just kind of looking and there's, you know, things are side by side, and if a customer might be confused, then that's a problem. And that's what trademark law is there to protect. So that customers are not confused when they go into the marketplace, that they don't think that something that they might've bought and weren't really paying attention to was actually somebody else's um, products. So, so I kind of tell people, I'm like, you know, do you want to actually be confused with another company? Like I know some people are like, well, I came, you know, I have this name and I, I want to use it. Well, this other company has it too, and they've been using it before you. So just think about the fact that, yeah, you now are probably on notice that you're infringing on some, some other company. And then two, what if that company starts making crappy stuff? Like, do you want to start getting the, the bad reviews because somebody got confused and didn't really know that you weren't that company? So just things to keep in mind. So like, 
definitely the first place to start is to do a search um, for your name, for your business. Um, so that can be like doing a Google search, like looking through the pages of Google, looking for things that are same or similar. Also looking on, you know, state uh, websites, like for the business databases, looking at names that have been registered. Um, and generally you can start with your state to do that. Also state trademark registries, there's are sometimes available, but you can do, look at the Secretary of State website to see if anyone's registered a trademark in the state for that name. So those are places to start. And then also the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So it's USPTO.gov. And if you go to the trademark tab, you can do a search using TESS, which is the Trademark Electronic Search System, and search to see if someone has either registered or expected to register or has a pending application for a name that is the same or so much yours. And just making sure like you can look to see if someone has that name you know, in the industry that you're in. And if that's the case, then we might need to look at possibly rebranding. But of course you might wanna to talk to an attorney before you go through that because you might not have to rebrand. You know, you might not be that close to that person or you might have actually started using it before then. So, you know, these are just places to start, um, especially when you're first starting out in business so that you're not spending money and you're not putting yourself as a target and ended up getting a cease and desist letter from somebody because you didn't realize that you were using somebody else's name in your business. And then, you know, rebranding is not cheap and neither are lawsuits. Any questions before I go on to all the rest of the fun stuff? Nope, nothing yet. All right. <laughs> we got a lot of wows and oh my gosh. I didn't <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it's, it's an amazing area of law. It's kind of crazy. I'm gonna take a sip of water, sorry. <laughs> so, one of the things that I know that happens a lot, and it's kind of like, you know, the fact that we were talking about with what happened with Sinead Jones and, you know, her, her trademark is dealing with copycats. And I try to tell people, I'm like, you know, it's not a matter of if, it's probably a matter of when. First of all, most businesses are now moving online and some people are not very original and are, you know, what they think is being inspired by someone is actually copying someone. And then also we're kind of running out of words. So like, there's only so many ways that we can describe stuff. And, you know, a lot of people want to stick to like being able to have things that people could spell and pronounce. So, you know, most of us don't have marketing departments that can help us come up with like, you know, that unique name that everybody's going to be like, oh, you know, the next Google or Pinterest, you know, maybe you can, you know, some people are creative and come up with some creative names, but most of us are not there yet. <laughs> so you know, sometimes we're not going to have something that even though it might be distinctive and considered unique in our industry, it might also be something that somebody else likes and wants to copy because they were like, yeah, I didn't see it registered. So I think I'm going to use it too and see how far I can get with it. So what are the things you can do before you get copied to kind of protect yourself from that? And then also what can you do after you've been copied? Um, so Definitely, if you have a website, put terms of service on your website. That way, you know, if somebody's copying like your content, like if you have a, a digital course or pictures on your website, videos, um, anything like that, you can actually protect those by letting you know, like if you're gonna be coming to this website, like please note that I own the intellectual property on this website and that you're, you know, if you're gonna be on here, that I own it and that I will, you know, use the force of the law to come after you. <laughs> So, you know, of course, registration of your copyrights and your trademarks are the, you know, high, high levels of protection. But if you're not there yet, then there's some things that you can do um, that can kind of help you along. Uh, also, you know, putting a copyright notice on your website, like if you kind of notice from my, I'm not going to, you're probably not going to be able to see my mouse, but at the bottom of my uh, slide, I have here the copyright notice, like the C for the circle, I have the year. And then I have my name because I am giving everyone notice that these are my slides that I put together um, and that I created them in 2020. I created them today. And then I'm C. Nicole Gaither, so that's my name. Um, so I am the, the owner of the copyright uh, in this work. So if someone wanted to use something from my slides or use my slides, they have to contact me to get permission to do it. And that like pretty much my copyright is automatic. So my protection is automatic here even though I don't have it registered. Um, if you have a trademark or, you know, so that's like your business name 
our product name, service name, a logo or a slogan. You can start using the TM next to it so that people can be on notice that you are using that as a trademark. So that's another way that you can kind of, you know, deter some people from actually trying to copy you. Again, these are not completely foolproof, but in some cases they do deter some people, the ones who actually are like, yeah, oh, I see it. Okay, I'm not gonna use that. Um, but, you know, some people are devious, so you can't really stop everyone. So let's say you're dealing with those devious people. Um, so definitely, if you see that someone is infringing on your work, document it, like take screenshots. If it's something that you've got, like, you know, a photo of or whatever, like keep the hard copy, like document the date that you are aware of it. Um, you definitely probably want to talk to an attorney at this point, because again, there are things that you can do on your own, but it's always best to actually talk to an attorney to see, you know, if, if one, it is even considered infringing. And two, understanding what your rights are and what you need to do to protect yourself. Because um, there might be a case where you might think it's infringing and actually you might be the infringer. And then you've now put yourself out there to this person that you decide to contact and go off on and then you're in the wrong. And then they're like, oh, well, you know, you owe me. So just, you know, again, these are things you probably want to talk to an attorney about, but there are also some things that, you know, just you can do on your own. So again, like document the infringement, like make a record of it keep screenshots. Um, so you're kind of building that record so that you can have evidence. Um, if you can actually, if you do know that you were like the first person to start using, it's like the, the trademark and you were the first person to start using that name and you know that this person just came after you, then you might want to reach out to them, like maybe send them an email or a direct message. Just be nice, you know, do it the friendly route. Like, hey, I noticed that you started using this and I just want to let you know that this is actually my intellectual property. And I do take my rights seriously. And I'm just gonna ask if you can remove it or stop using it. Some people do respond to that because they didn't know and they wanna you know, keep the peace. And they're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm sorry, I didn't even realize it. And you know, they'll tell you like, oh, I found it online. I didn't know it was owned by somebody or whatever, sometimes. And in some cases you might get that person who's like, yeah, I really don't care what you have to say and I'm gonna keep using it. So then, you know, again, this is probably where you want to get an attorney involved, but then if you decide you still want to handle it on your own, maybe you just need to send a formal letter that's maybe not as sweet as the one that you sent via email and just document again what you've said and just said like, hey, again, I'm going to ask you to stop. I already told you to stop using my, my trademark or my logo, or I told you to stop using my, my photos. And I just want to let you know that again, I'm repeating and asking if you would stop doing it. So these are again, these are ways that I try to tell people, I'm like, the, ultimately, you know, your rights can be enforced through a lawsuit, but you also have to have things registered for that to take place. On copyright, you cannot sue unless you have a re you have registered your copyright. Trademarks, you can sue if you have not registered a trademark, but you're very limited in your rights. So if you have not registered your trademark, you probably, you know, you cannot sue somebody if you're in Maryland and they're in California and they're using your trademark because you have very limited rights. So you're limited to what is going on in your state until you actually have registered because registration gives you exclusive nationwide rights over that trademark. So once you have that registration, it gives you a license to tell everybody like, I own this nationwide, you cannot use it and I can stop you from doing it. But until you actually have that, you're very limited in what you can do. Um, be very careful if you're writing any messages to anyone that you do not threaten to sue them because, you know, in some states, threats to sue actually need to, you know, can lead to bad consequences. Uh, one, that person could turn around and sue you because they might decide they want a judge to decide who is in the right. Um, so that can happen. And then, you know, if you're carrying out a threat to sue, generally, like there's some ethics, uh, you know, in some states, like where laws, you know, attorneys are held to ethics, where like, if you're gonna make that threat, you better carry it out. So be very careful what you put in a letter. That's why I always tell people like talk to an attorney before you take this rep. But if you do feel that you, you know, I got this, I can handle it. Then, you know, these are things that you can do. Um, if it's something that is like content wise, like someone, you know, took your photos without permission, your videos, you can actually contact a website or web platform or even like, you know, Instagram, TikTok. I think TikTok does it, I hope. Um, so you can file what's called a DMCA takedown notice. And this is the Digital Millennial Copyright Act takedown notice. 
this is where like these third party platforms. So like this would be like um, possibly Google, but like it could be a web host. So like a GoDaddy or like a Shopify or Etsy or eBay, um, like the social media platforms like Instagram, they all have an un The process of doing a DMCA takedown notice um, with the platforms, and that can help you actually get those things taken down. Now, there are some things where if this person believes that they're in the right, they might actually file what's called a counter notice where they write back and tell the, the platform, like, no, I own this and I'm right, and so I'm going to, I want to keep it up. So if they do write a counter notice, notice then you're now on notice to let you, you know, to tell you whether or not you want to sue. So like if you get that counter notice and you decide you want to sue, you technically have about 10 days to, you know, present that lawsuit to that person. So that's one route you can take. Of course, that's almost like the, you know, probably should consult with an attorney before you go that route. But again, there are options that you can you take on your own. And then someone wanted to know, how do you find the license numbers for photos as you have on um, like these photos at the bottom? And she says, is it um, okay to use without their permission? So I got mine from the Creative Commons. So Creative Commons actually allows you to use certain photos, like there's certain licenses for some of the photos, but um, for the Creative Commons, if it's available, like some of them will actually have a specific license, like can only can be used for commercial, you know, non-commercial purposes or personal purposes can't be used for these things. But generally, if you go to the Creative Commons, you can see what photos are available and what the licenses are. And if it's the license that you need, like let's say you are just using it for like, for me, it's a presentation for educational purposes. So it's not technically for commercial purposes that I'm giving instructions and information. So like, but I made sure that I got every one of my photos in the Creative Commons. So I didn't go, you know, download Google Photos, but you can also get a license, so like you can use the Creative Commons and get a license through them. Um, Shutterstock, you can pay, I think, for some of the licenses, it's the right to use some of those things, so those images and photos and whatever other media they have. Um, Adobe Stock, I think there's Pick Stock. There are a couple like stock image um, sites that you can actually get a license, but you need to make sure because certain licenses have certain requirements. So like I mentioned, like some you can't use for commercial purposes. So like if you were gonna be using an image and put it on a t-shirt, you might not be able to do that. But you just, you know, so mine came with Creative Commons. So that's one place where you can actually get images and you know, that you have, you don't have to like go look for the copyright owner to get permission. So the Creative Commons is one area where that's available to you. Did I answer the question? Yep, she says that's good stuff. <laughs> So yeah, definitely like, you know, you don't have to always, you should always seek permission if you're gonna be using something, but there are things that are available. Now, sometimes the stuff in Creative Commons isn't all that great. So like for a while, I actually was paying for Adobe stock because the photos were a lot better. But then I was like, you know, I don't necessarily need all, you know, 300 stock photos every month, but you know, it's nice to have something different from everybody else. So on the flip side, what should you do if you end up getting a cease and desist letter or, or you know, you receive a DMCA takedown notice? Um, so these are kind of the, the procedures are kind of the same. So like a cease and desist letter and a DMCA takedown notice are almost the same. If someone telling you, you know, like I have the rights to this and I want you to stop using it. So, you know, this person is basically letting you know that you possibly are infringing on their rights, whether it's their trademark or their copyright. You know, it could even be a patent. Uh, if it gets to that level, you definitely should consult with an attorney because that is like, you know, way, way outside of my area of law. And if you're being accused of infringing on a patent, you actually probably are dealing with something a lot deeper than this. Um, so if you do get a letter accusing you of infringement and usually, you know, 
that person wants you to stop doing what you're doing. And if you're in the wrong, you should stop doing what you're doing. If you feel like you're in the right, then you know you probably want to consult with an attorney to see what you should be doing. But you know, again, there's some things that you can do on your own. So as I mentioned, the you know DMCA notice, like a, a good example of this, and I saw this a lot with a lot of people who like right, you know, when the pandemic hit and people were making masks and they were buying fabric from like the Joanne shop. And so like some of the fabric at Joanne shop, like I know some people were like, oh, I bought this Disney fabric and it's got like Elsa on it. And it's, you know, they sell it. So I'm going to make masks from it. Not so fast because some of the fabric there is not licensed for you to sell commercially. Like there's actually a note on the bulk of fabric that you probably didn't see that Joanne should tell you that says for personal use only or for like, your immediate household and not for commercial use. So a lot of people were buying these bolts of fabric or like taking blankets and cutting them up and making masks out of stuff and like using Disney and Marvel and every other cartoon character and selling them on like Etsy and everywhere else. And then getting notices from like, you know, getting DMCA notices from like Etsy saying we've removed these images from your, your, your photo, I mean, from your, your store because we got a, you know, a takedown notice and an infringement complaint. So come to find out, most of them were using materials that they didn't have permission to use and didn't have the proper license to use. So an example I give is of course, like either the Elsa or like, you know, I don't want to use Black Panther now just because like I, I love Black Panther and I, you know, rest in peace Chadwick. But let's say like, for example, you do have this Etsy shop and you have masks and you, you've been using like Disney, and you know Charlie Brown or any characters because you had the material, you bought it and you made masks. Well, you get a notice from, it's usually sent via email and it's from Etsy. And it says like, we received a complaint regarding some of the images in your store or some of the items that you were selling. And you know, we, the you know, intellectual property rights holder has you know, noticed that this is possibly infringing and we have removed these things from your store. So the notice will actually tell you you know, what's been removed and who told you, like, you know, you kind of see, you know, if you go further down, scroll down, like, and always in my notes because it just happened to one of my clients, unfortunately, but, you know, it, it, it happened. But you'll know, like, it might be the NFL, it could be a major league baseball, it could be the NBA, like all these people actually own licenses. And if you do not get permission to use it or pay the licensing fees, they're going to send you a takedown notice. Um, so, just be careful what you're doing. Like if you don't have permission or the right licenses or proper, you know, paperwork in place, then you do not want to be on the other side of these things because they might still sue you. So anyway, you know, you'll get this DMCA notice, they will take down your stuff and you either have the right to just be like, okay, yeah, I was sorry, you know, you can write and let them know like, I'm sorry, I was, you know, I made a mistake. Some attorneys will tell you like, do not admit you are infringing. <laughs> and I kind of tell my clients, I'm like, yeah, we're not gonna admit that just yet. Just be like, I respect your intellectual property rights. And you know, even though I do not agree with you, I will remove these things. Then sometimes if you're nice enough, depending on who you're dealing with, they might be like, I did not know this was wrong. I apologize. And you know, maybe you can ask to see if you can get you know, a license from them. In most cases, Disney is not that accommodating. From what I understand, like they do not really care about your little letter and your little store after that, because they're like, you've already infringed, we're done with you. Um, but if you feel like you're not infringing, like let's say you did, you know, your own artwork and it might look similar to like somebody who is a famous character, but you designed it yourself and it's not that famous character. If you feel strongly enough that you are not infringing, then maybe you are, you know, you should write that counter notice. Again, talk to an attorney about this and let them know like, hey, you know, got your letter. And there's a format for this, of course, but you also just kind of letting know like, I do not agree with your stance and I do not feel like that I'm infringing. Now, when you are signing these letters, both the takedown notice and the counter notice, you are stating under penalty of perjury of law. So like you are stating that you are telling the truth or else you could actually be found guilty of perjury. So. Be aware of this when you are, you know, doing these things. So that's why I tell you, like, talk to an attorney to make sure that you're not putting yourself in a position where you're going to have even bigger problems. So, you know, if you do find yourself in one of these situations, talk to an attorney. If you're going to do it on your own, be very careful 
what you're doing and know exactly what you are doing. And that, you know, if you feel that you are in the right, then, you know, make, make sure like protect, you know, if you're in the right and you feel that you're in the right and you have, you know, a reason for like why you do not agree, then it's definitely, you know, do something to protect yourself and write that letter so that you can, you know, if your store has been shut down or whatever, and that's your source of income and you don't agree with it, then, you know, take the, take those steps, but talk to an attorney before you put yourself in a bigger position where you're like sitting there getting a 200 page complaint from Disney or anyone. And because most of them already have these complaints drafted, they're just doing fill in the blank and putting your stuff in there and they will have it served on you or sent to you. And then you're like, okay, well, what do I do now? Because they're going to move forward, whether you show up in court or not. Um, so just things to be aware of, especially in today's day and age that everything is online. And uh, they do have attorneys that, that all day, they probably are sitting there looking for infringements because they have those resources. I'm trying to think that there's anything else I wanted to say about that, but I think that is probably it. So. Yeah, that's all I have. I know that people are going to have a lot of questions. So I wanted to actually kind of reserve this for like a little fireside chat kind of situation. So if you do have any questions, you want to get in touch with me. Uh, again, my name is Nicole Gaither. I'm a partner at the Politory Law Group. And I'm in the business law section. I focus on trademarks and copyrights. And my email address is nicole.gaither at parlatorylawgroup.com. Okay. I think this was good stuff. I mean, definitely. <laughs> so many. Oh God, I went over time. You didn't tell me. <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, it was so many things that you're like, oh my God, oh my God, I didn't think about that. And um, especially when you talked about like the mask thing, because everybody was like, yep, I'm going to get a mask and yeah, I want this. And, you know, people will send you their picture of the 15 different. <laughs> And then all the imitation like luxury brands and all that kind of stuff too, all those things. And it's just those things that you don't necessarily think of. And um, I know everybody was like, oh my gosh, you know, the things that you didn't think of, but also how simple it is to do some of the copyright portion. So just really um, protecting that portion and understanding, wait, I can do these little things without going through so much in terms of like hiring an attorney and so forth yeah. so if you're making information um i know we have a few writers in the um group so when they're like putting together their books and so forth everybody was like what oh my gosh i didn't know so a couple of people oh, said yeah. thank you um this was great information somebody else said this was great somebody wants i'm gonna drop your email in the comments i got that for you kimberly but it's so much stuff and you're like which one do i do and if you're right. just starting out um, I mean, cause I know a lot of people, you know, especially I'm a huge Disney fan and so it's always Disney stuff out there galore. Um, and I know Disney doesn't play, but it's, you know, the same way they're relentless in protecting their brand. Oftentimes we can't be because if we are one of one employees or one of two employees, the whole job is to get clients and to ship out goods and make more goods and those kind of things. So you probably don't have necessarily time for that. But I know um, oftentimes we'll see some where people will say, go, go tell that person to quit selling my stuff. And I've seen that for like some of the newer bags and cups and so forth as people are like designing and printing out with like their circuits and so forth. So just to kind of know and to not, you know, the thing about, oh my bad, I didn't mean to steal your stuff. Like, I don't know. I think a lot of people might respond in that way. Or um, if you're just upset because if you see that someone stolen your intellectual property to quickly say, take that down or I'll sue you. I think it's, yeah, some of those things that might come natural to us aren't necessarily the greatest responses all the time. Right. It's like, if you say that, you better be prepared. And like, <laughs> that's what I tell people. I'm like, yeah, they're like, well, you know, Louis Vuitton's not going to care about my mask. Oh, okay. Tell that to the people who've gotten 200 pages. And I'm not joking. Like these things are 200 pages and they come like this in a package. And it's usually a cease and desist letter. And under it is a copy of the lawsuit they plan on filing against you if they have to. So, you know, yeah, they're huge. They're a multi-million co dollar company. But how would you feel if you were on the other end of that? Would you like, would you want somebody to be like, oh, well, you're nobody. You're a small person. Like, I'll, I'm just, you know, nobody's going to really matter, you know, care if, you, if I take your stuff. So like, just think about 
if you were on the other end of that. But yeah. <laughs> And I know everybody's like, oh, because we've gotten a bunch of likes and stuff too. It's just, it's amazing how much stuff um, we need to protect in this day and age. And I think part of it comes down to how quickly we can form a business or form a brand and really get ramped up. Unfortunately, unfortunately, we are influencers. Um, and so really and truly any and everything that we do when we start to create things, all of a sudden someone else says, well, that seems popular. People like that. I should just take it. And to be able to show that, no, I've been using it longer. I've put this and this and this documentation in place. Those things are huge. And unfortunately, you know, we're usually so busy creating and figuring out how we can do X, Y, Z and understanding what can be copywritten and what can be trademarked. Um, I think sometimes we just don't, you know, Rosalind's best cakes might not necessarily be. <laughs> um, so sometimes even when we're coming up with a great name, if you're um, if you're making things, I know it's a lady, I think she calls it like hair crack or something like that. So if you're oh, making wow. that, you might have to do a brainstorming session and say, well, you know, is that something we can or is it something that we um, can't and think bigger, you know, always create with the thought that you're going to be a multi-million dollar corporation and to protect it sooner rather than later. Right. And that's what I tell people. I'm like, what are your goals with this? Like, are you planning on, glo- you know, going global? Are you planning on expanding? Would you like to sell it in the future? So, so these are things that you need to keep in mind when you're actually picking out your tra- you know, the names that you're using, the logos that you're using. And if you plan on changing your name in like a year or two, and there's no sense of you going through the registration process. So if it's something that you plan on using and you're going to keep it for like five years, 10 years, that's when we need to start talking about, like, let's figure this out. I love it. Well, let's see. I think those are the questions. A few people wanted the email, so I'm sure they have specific <laughs> questions. They'll be reaching out to you. All um, right. But I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I want to thank everybody who joined us through um, Facebook as well. This is key. I mean, um, it's funny. Last week we talked about, we had a great topic um, where we were talking about real estate investment trust. And people were like, I never heard of this. And this was another one of those weeks where it's like, wow, I didn't know. I didn't, I didn't realize that. I didn't realize these little pieces. And it's funny because oftentimes at the bottom of a presentation, you'll see that kind of copyright um, real estate. Right. And you're like, Goodness, what did they do to do that? And really, it's just put it there. I just typed it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, when I was thinking, it's like, how valuable is this presentation to me to go pay for? It? I read just, you know, like, it's not, there are some things where I'm kind of like, is it valuable to you? Like, if it was stolen, would it hurt your heart? I don't want somebody to take my presentation, but I won't be like going after you. Like, I'm not filing a lawsuit. <laughs> <like that. laughs> No, and it's a good practice to have because yeah. um, if you're I know like the mastermind classes are like really big now so if you're teaching one portion of what you do whether it be that you do hair and now you want to put together a presentation in terms of like how to build out a beauty salon or how to organize a team or how to you know color hair or whatever it might be it's huge to know okay I'm putting together these like step by step by steps well, that, that is huge. That's a part of, because if not, somebody can take that whole presentation and say, yeah, I've never done hair in my life, but I'm going to teach this class because she did such a good job the first right. round. Right. And it's um, like, <laughs> it, it, you know, if that person decided they were going to teach their own class, that's one thing. Like, they had the idea. But if they take your entire presentation, like, your everything that you've done, like, your step-by-step guide, that's a problem. Like, that's where, you know, we're running to the issues. <laughs> someone else said thank you she said she has some action items now and I think I mean we've talked about so many people in this COVID time where we're going from okay I'm working my nine to five but now I think I can really put some time into creating something or building out my hobby or whatever it might be and if that's the case you know which steps to go through whether it be you know is this to the point where you need a patent or is it something that you're, comp- it, what steps are you making? Because if you're, and especially in kind of the fire world, as we're talking about transitioning out and having some financial independence, it might be that you never want this business to get large. You want something to keep you kind of engaged as you transition out of your nine to five. 
Well, even then you still want it to be protected enough that it'll give you a certain amount of income, a certain amount of return for your work, or even it's just something that you want to be able to sell later or transition to someone else later, that kind of thing. And it's key. So yeah, I think this is great information. I was like putting notes down and <laughs> I could talk for hours about this. That's why I was like, let me narrow it down. But then I looked at the time. I was like, oh my God, I talked for that long. <laughs> no, but people were like, yes. And we were getting the thumbs up and the wows. And I'm like, I didn't know. <laughs> like, if I had gone into like deeper, y'all had been like, um, I've heard enough. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm good. <laughs> I think this is like our level one and get to start it. Um, and I'm sure we'll have like some more questions, some more people. I love um, if you take this presentation and this information and you do some steps over the next week or two, I'd love for you all to come back to the presentation and drop it in the chat um, so we can come back and kind of see what people are doing and what they're doing with the information. I think that's great because really that's our purpose is to enable um, and strengthen and make everybody kind of that much stronger as they pursue their goals and get so much more information to go to the next steps. And if you need anything specific, reach out to Nicole. Her email address is in the chat as well. Um, so feel free to reach out to her directly. And I want to say thank you so much thank for you. joining. This was amazing. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you. Any closing remarks? Um, definitely make sure that you're not infringing on somebody else's work. Get permission to do stuff and protect your work. You know, of course, always, you know, I always tell people like take the steps to register your work, but if you're not there yet, then make sure that you can own what you're doing and are able to protect it. So, you know, if it's like going on YouTube and looking for attorneys, uh, you know, videos, do it, you know, if it's contacting and reaching out to attorneys and just getting those starting steps, just find out what you should be doing. But yeah, I mean, I, I talk about it all day, like I said. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. This was an absolute You're welcome, pleasure. Awesome. This was so much good information. Um, if anything, if you don't do anything else, I know I even put a note. I was like, I might need to rewind and go back through and <laughs> watch a couple pieces too. Um, but it's so key as we're growing and learning. And the last thing you want to do is learn the hard way because someone else took the steps that you didn't or um, that you're out making Mickey Mouse mask and, you know, you get there. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have some paperwork from Disney <laughs> saying that you can make those Mickey Mouse masks, do not, do not be an example. Like, I, we can't all be Dapper Don. I'm sorry. <laughs> like, that man was almost homeless because Gucci came after him. And then they were like, oh, yeah, you know what? We kind of like what you did back then. <laughs> we, we're not all there. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. None of the seat covers and all that kind of stuff, right. too. So it just kind of puts things into perspective in terms of, you know, what you're going to do. So do a meaty mouse and add a Mickey mouse or whatever and change it up a little bit. Yeah. Do your own mouse. That doesn't look like, he doesn't have like, you know, yellow shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Call him something else. <laughs> exactly. So I want to thank you so much. Um, the ladies have thanked you so much in the um, chat as well. Thank I you. Feel you're hard. welcome go around and definitely reach out to Nicole if you have any special questions and go out and be great. Yeah. Thank you. Good night. All right. Bye. Thanks.